You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to be doing some experiments regarding water bridges. Well, hello there, and welcome back to my weekly show. Today's video comes from a poll that I essentially sent out to you guys after my last video a month ago, where I listed a few video ideas and had you guys vote on which one you wanted to see most. And so this one beat out the other videos that were going to be such as charged mass ratio of an electron, um, the quantum eraser, which is a pretty cool experiment. And after this video, I'll put out a new poll with some video ideas after I see what suggestions you guys have in the comment section below, and I'll throw those into a poll, and the highest one voted will be the one that I make this next week. Now without me rambling on too much more, let's jump straight into the topic of the video, which is water bridges. To give some overview on the experimentation we're going to be doing today, a water bridge is essentially a phenomenon that's observed when we take two beakers and we place them close together and fill them each up with deionized or distilled water, and it's very important, by the way, that it is distilled, because any presence of ions will greatly reduce the stability of the water bridge, and we will essentially not observe anything. Anyways, when we place them close together and apply a high voltage direct current across it, we note that the water starts to creep up along the top of it, and, in fact, as we pull the beakers apart, we start to see a bridge form between the beakers, which, within the bridge, we do start to see a flow of water, which is because the charges are kind of dragging along the molecules of water with it, and we start to see the water heat up to around 60 degrees Celsius, uh, and also, the bridge is theorized to be held up by tangential electric field forces along, or tangential to the surface of the water anyways, electric field forces compared to the gravitational force, and so when the gravitational force along the bridge of the water essentially exceeds the electric field that's tangential to the surface of the water, then we see the bridge collapse. Now please take my explanation on how this works with a little bit of a grain of salt, because although it turns out that this phenomenon has been observed for over 100 years, and it is very well understood on a macroscopic view, like we're able to essentially predict exactly what the shape of the water bridge will be, and the radius of curvature leading up to it, and the length that we should be able to achieve based on the Coulomb interactions and the force of gravity pulling it downwards, all of which was still also um, very new research. In fact, the research papers that I read up on this were from 2012, 2010, and 2008. Kind of nice spacing there, right? I'll have those cited in the description of the video if you want to read up on them, but on a microscopic view, it is very, very ill understood. And this is by no fault of our own theories in, for instance, quantum electrodynamics and basically fluid mechanics. Uh, well, it's kind of at fault of our theories, mainly because the things are so, so complicated. And it may just have to be that way due to how complicated it is on the inside of it. So rather than concern ourselves with all that silly math business, let's just jump straight into the experimentation and we'll try to build a linear model that will essentially range from about 10,000 volts to maybe 35,000 volts, and we'll see exactly how well our fit is. And of course, I just mean a linear model for the amount that we can move it apart and the voltage across it to see kind of what the ratios are. Um, so not really that in-depth, but regardless, this is a very beautiful looking thing, and I highly recommend you to uh, do, do, do. And I don't recommend you do it at home, because this uses high voltage. The containers I'm going to be using for this experiment are these two small beakers here. Now you can of course use any container you like, however, these beakers do have these little lips that kind of lead up, and so it's going to be much easier to form the uh, thread that we're looking for. So I'm going to take these and fill them up with double distilled water, and of course regular distilled water will work, but likely not as nice. And so since I have double distilled, might as well use it. And I'm going to fill it up to the point where essentially they are up that lip slightly, like that guy is there. And now this guy needs a little more. There we go. And so now with the beakers filled up to where the water is essentially almost bridging the gap between these two lips, I'm going to go ahead and set up our high voltage. As per usual with my high voltage experiments, I'm going to be using this as my high voltage power supply. If you want to learn how to make this, we did actually build this in a previous video, so I will have that linked down in the description below. However, this is extremely dangerous, because not only does it output high voltage, but it also outputs a high current with that high voltage. So the arcs produced by this will make a plasma so hot it can easily burn through paper, your skin, apples, um, essentially anything you put it up to. Uh, not anything, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you understand what I mean. This is an extremely dangerous thing that should not be taken lightly. Alright, so now with the high voltage negative over here and the high voltage positive over here, I have it all connected up, and so when I turn on the power supply, you can see... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Anyways, as I was saying, now with the high voltage terminals connected up, I can go ahead and turn on the power. Very good. And we can see across the middle we start to get the water flow across. And, let me go ahead and turn down the voltage, let's start out with uh, 
Actually, okay, right here is around 24,400 volts. And if I move them, oh, this is very static. If I move them a little bit further apart, oh, you can see that purple in the other one. That's because I guess it's not super well connected. But you can see we start to get a water bridge forming. Let's see. So at that point, oh, you can see those particles flying over. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Alright, so before we start taking our principal measurements for essentially our linear fit to the voltage versus how long we can stretch it out, let's get one more close-up of what just happened. So I'm going to turn on the power supply here, and currently it is at 12,000 volts, which isn't too high, but it's also not too low. So let's see what happens then as I stretch it apart. And you can definitely see that the water is flowing from the positive to the negative. Let's see if I can get to that kind of flow happening again. Or, yeah, of course we know that, because a moment ago we were seeing the droplets fly that direction. So, this alone is already just at, I guess it's at like 13,000. Let's reconnect to the water bridge here. So, for instance, right here at 13,000, it looks like it stretches out to that point. So, what I'm going to be doing is essentially changing the voltage, and then measuring the separation that we get there at a given voltage, and I'll do a few trial runs and then average those numbers um, at every single given voltage. And so, uh, essentially you're going to just see a, um, what is it, compilation of all the measurements that I'm taking. I'm not going to have voices over it, I'll have a subtitle saying which voltage it is that I'm doing at that current moment, and hopefully it should be good, and then we'll come back and try to make our linear fit. Now, although it looks like not much is happening, there is still 0.44 amps going through this circuit. Um, so there's enough charge to complete that. Let me go ahead and zoom out the camera a bit, just to show you guys this, because I think it's pretty interesting. Right here I have the paper, which by the way, is very much, when I bring it near here, it's being sucked towards the box behind it. Whoops. If I get it too close, you can see it just arc over through the paper. Because the paper, even though this is distilled water, and I probably just ruined the experiment there a bit, um, so I am going to replace the water here in a moment, because any presence of ions will greatly reduce the stability of the water bridge. But you can see that even through the distilled water, the paper is incredibly conductive. Um, and even along the glass rim there and through it all, that looks pretty beautiful though in a way. And there we go, don't know why I did that. Oh, one second. There we go. All right. The right side, this negative side, definitely feels quite a bit warmer than this positive side. Like this one right here, it's just kind of lukewarm, but this one feels like it's right below the point of boiling. Like this is painfully hot. 
So that is fairly interesting, and I am not exactly sure why this side would be hotter than that side. So some things that we noticed were first off, the water seemed to be going from the positive side to the negative side, as we saw the water droplets flinging across and smashing into that negative beaker. Um, some more things that we observed was that the water was kind of more bunched up on the positive side, so you'd see it start off more thick there and then narrow out as it went over to the negative beaker. Also, we observed the negative beaker's temperature to be quite a bit higher than the positive beaker, and we saw a lot of steam coming off of the negative beaker. Or at least I did. I'm not exactly sure if it showed up in video yet. We'll see. And of course, the obvious result is that with higher voltages, we observed longer bridges being formed, and more thick bridges at the beginning especially, and I guess throughout at any given length. So without further ado, here's a plot of the data I collected during this video. As you can see, it's actually a fairly linear fit. So now you know the phenomenon of the water bridge, and how it looks, and some of the general properties that it maintains. Now despite my warnings to not do this, if you do try it at home, which uh, again, you shouldn't, because I don't want to get sued, then please exercise every safety precaution possible. So, with that said, don't be discouraged to do science, because it's a whole lot of fun. Just be safe with the science, or you'll end up like the Curies. So, <laughs> please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. See you guys next time. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to be building and talking about some properties of the cathode ray tube. 